So we're going to talk about the GPCRs, GS, and GI pathways. And so we're going to first start with the GS pathway, and then we'll add on the GI second. So um, remember that G protein coupled receptors look like this. They span the membrane seven times. There are seven transmembrane spanning domains. And the G protein sits in an inactivated state. And we can just depict that as the gamma, the beta, and the alpha subunit. In this case, we're now going to add an S to indicate that this is the GS pathway. And it's bound to the GDP, and that is the inactive state where the heterotrimeric complex is all together. Remember that the ligand binds to the outside portion of the receptor. This is the N-terminus. That causes a conformational change to the receptor that changes the affinity of the G alpha subunit for GTP rather than GDP. And so we have a dissociation of the gamma and beta subunit. Here is the alpha S now bound to GTP and now this is the active G protein. Okay, now we said that when the G protein is active, that there's gonna be a target enzyme. And the target enzyme here is gonna be an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. We're gonna call that AC. So AC, that stands for adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase is going to make something called cyclic AMP from ATP. So ATP is right here. That normally is made into, in this case, cyclic AMP. And it's the G-alpha S, an activated state, that's gonna turn on this enzyme adenylate cyclase. Now, when you produce the cyclic AMP, there's, you're producing many of them. And one of the important one of the important targets of cyclic AMP is gonna be a protein that looks like this, made up of some different subunits, okay? We'll call the R for regulatory subunits and C for catalytic subunits, and it's just like this heterodimer. And the cyclic AMP can go and bind into these little binding spots on the regulatory subunit and this protein here that is binding to is an inactive, what we call protein kinase A, or PKA. So it's inactive. And when the cyclic AMP binds to those regulatory subunits, we have a release of those regulatory subunits, and we end up with an active PKA and that would just be like the two catalytic subunits, all right? And the active PKA, what that means is that it's going to phosphorylate proteins, and it happens to be a serine threonine kinase, which means that it puts phosphates on the hydroxyl groups of um, serine and threonine amino acid residues. And so the way we can show that is we can just have some protein in the cell Okay, and there's just an example of a hydroxyl group for one of those amino acids, serine or threonine. And that protein is either in an active state or an inactive state. We don't really know. It could be either one. And in the process of getting phosphorylated by active PKA, which is going to use ATP as the phosphate donor for that, um, now I have a protein with this phosphate put onto it. And now that protein is going to be modified. It's either going to be now going from inactive to active or active to inactive. And it really depends on the protein. You have to know what that protein is and how it reacts to this phosphorylation. So it doesn't always mean that you're going to have an activated protein when it gets phosphorylated. It could certainly be uh, the other way around where the activity is turned down. 
if you're wondering about what sorts of proteins could be phosphorylated here, there's a number of examples that the protein could be. It could be an ion channel, it could be a transporter, it could be an enzyme, uh, it could be an enzyme as part of a metabolic pathway, it could be transcriptional regulators, there's a variety of different things it could be, and you just have to know those examples when they come up. I'll also point out that one of the other interesting things that this cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase can do is that it can enter the nucleus. And so this is an organelle, this is the nucleus, and I'm just gonna put in this nucleus just like a generic gene, okay? Something that looks like that, okay? This is whatever the gene might be for. And there's a response element, we call it cyclic AMP response element. There's a part of the DNA that can be bound by protein uh, 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 that can be phosphorylated by, by PKA. And we can have this sort of sitting here, we'll call this CREB. CREB stands for cyclic AMP response element binding protein. So it's a binding protein that binds to the cyclic AMP response element on that gene. And what happens is that the PKA that's active now can go into the nucleus and it can phosphorylate CREB. And what happens when, when CREB is phosphorylated is it can then interact with various co-activators or co-repressors and you can get a change in gene expression. So not only can PKA modify existing proteins within the cell and change their activity, it could also have effects on the production of a protein, either turning it on or turning it down, depending on how that CREB is going to be interacting with these various uh, transcriptional regulating proteins, okay? So that is how the GS pathway is activated, okay? Now, if I wanted to put on the GI pathway, that is very easy because I can, we can maybe put this as a different receptor here. We'll, we'll have this in purple, something like that. Okay, so this is gonna be the GI. And um, it's the same exact process. We have some ligand here that's gonna bind to the outside of the receptor. Now when I have the activated GI protein, the difference is that it's going to inhibit adenylate cyclase. So when the GI protein is activated, it does the opposite of what the GS, what the GS pathway does. It turns down the production of cyclic AMP and everything downstream. So it's really the opposing G protein to GS. Another thing that um, often that the GI coupled receptors can do is that the beta gamma subunit part of the receptor can often also have additional effects, particularly on activating potassium channels. Um, we'll look at examples more specifically with that later. Now what I wanna point out next is how do you turn off these G protein pathways? And so what I wanna do is focus first on the GS pathway and then after that, the GI pathway is fairly straightforward. It's just kind of similar in concept. So how do we turn off the GS pathway? Well, first thing is the ligand has to unbind and it sort of diffuses away. So we can call that number one of turning the system off is if there's no ligand activating the receptor, then that stimulus is gonna go away and that will then help turn off this, this pathway. Another part of how you can turn this off is that there's intrinsic GTPA's activity that's uh, part of the G alpha subunit. And what that does is that hydrolyzes the GTP back to GDP and reforms that inactive heterotrimeric complex. Another mechanism of turning off the GS pathway would be enzymes that are going to metabolize the cyclic AMP. And there are enzymes that exist in the cell. They're called phosphodiesterases. P, D, E, and that breaks down the cyclic AMP. We can call this mechanism number three. And that is another way of turning off the system because you're now removing the cyclic AMP, which is gonna be activating these processes that, that we've talked about. 
Another possibility is that there are protein phosphatases that can remove, usually we're talking about using water to do this. Call that number four. That is gonna remove the phosphate from the protein that PKA put on, and that's gonna then reverse the effects. So there's a number of control mechanisms that um, are, are all working together to make sure that the cell doesn't get overstimulated. Okay, now there's a number of um, clinical examples or medical examples that where these things can go awry. There are, for example, there can be mutations in the GTPase activity that prevents it from working and that continues to keep the cell in a persistently activated state with respect to the G, in this case, the GS protein, making lots of cyclic AMP. There's a, a toxin called cholera toxin that can do that. There's also drugs that are out there that can inhibit phosphodiesterases. There's many of them are available um, for a, a number of different disorders. And what they do is they magnify the effects in this case of cyclic AMP. And you can imagine that if you turn off any of these mechanisms to in, uh, disable the GS pathway, you end up with more GS signaling. Now, in terms of the GI pathway, in terms of turning that off, um, it's pretty much the same general idea. You can have the ligand can unbind, the ligand can unbind, and also there's intrinsic GTPase activity that can turn off the G protein. Now there is a difference. Phosphodiesterases would not be part of the mechanism of turning off the GI pathway because it's not increasing cyclic AMP production. In fact, it's reducing cyclic AMP production. So phosphodiesterase would not be a mechanism of turning it off. That would be a mechanism of, it would actually be enhancing the, the GI pathway. And that same thing for the protein phosphatases, right? Because the GI pathway is reducing the, the activation of PK and all the downstream effects. So as far as turning off the GI pathway, it would really be the, just, just these two uh, mechanisms here. There's also another mechanism of turning off, in general, these pathways, and that would be something more long-term where the receptors themselves can be down-regulated and desensitized. And that specific topic is gonna be something that we're gonna discuss in another video. But that is another more long-term mechanism of regulating these pathways.